What are you doing, Katie? Oh, I'm just uh, heading over to this other rock to get uh, the clearest shot of this amazing landscape. So this other rock that's like on the edge of a cliff, <laughs> just she says. Just like, another rock. Just another rock that has about a 955 foot drop to the river in the middle of nowhere. It's November 2020, and I'm in a remote part of New Mexico called the Gila Wilderness. And I'm standing on a cliff with producer Brian Gutierrez and National Geographic photographer Katie Orlinski, who's on assignment for an upcoming magazine story. We rode horses for a few hours this morning, winding through forests of enormous ponderosa pine trees to reach this spot. It's a place our guide calls the Grand Canyon of the Gila. And that's just what it looks like. Majestic red, yellow, and white bands of rock towering over a broad, flat valley. We're the only people here. In fact, we haven't seen any other human beings for a week. The only sound is a light wind rustling the pine needles. We watch a hawk gliding in the void below us, its shadow moving across the valley floor. It's, a, it's really a spectacular view. You're going to have to buy the magazine to, to see this. <laughs> or come to New Mexico. Or come to New Mexico. Actually, that's an even better. New Mexico. You can follow me. <laughs> what, are you, what are you guys talking about? Yeah, it's a little too tight here. We're looking We're for alternate campers. We're going to start looking for a place to camp. A local guide named Joe Sines brought us up here to this vantage point called the Eagle's Nest. And Katie, being the dedicated photographer that she is, is climbing out onto a far ledge that offers the best view scaring the heck out of me and Brian. It's like we're on the edge of the Grand Canyon and Katie just stepped over the abyss to get to a better spot to take a picture. Yeah, the only difference here in the Gila Wilderness, there's no railing that says, hey, tourists, danger, do not cross this line. Which is why we love it. Which is why we love it, exactly. The Gila is a federally protected wilderness area where human activity is extremely restricted. So when I was a kid, I dreamed of exploring a place like this. A landscape that changes with every bend in the trail, every crest of a hill, a place that constantly surprises you. We'd ride the horses out of dense thickets of willows, up a steep winding set of switchbacks dotted with alligator junipers and pinions, which would then give way to a view of mountain ranges stretching all the way to the horizon. And then we'd descend into a new labyrinth of dark, narrow canyons. We'd crisscross rivers and discover hidden pools and waterfalls. And in the rock faces, we'd see faces and animals. And Joe would point out ancient cliff dwellings. People talk about the spires, Joe. Do they mean this area, or are there lots of different areas that look like spires? All this beautiful, rugged terrain is great for a rider but it can make it challenging for Katie to do her job, especially while riding horses. On the first day we set out, her best camera broke. Come on, my bag fell. The back of my camera now looks like this. Oh my God. It doesn't mean it's not taking pictures, but I need to make sure. Watching her take photos on horseback is like watching an acrobat. Sometimes she's leaning, sometimes she's standing in the stirrups. Oh yes, yeah, so when the trail makes these sharp curves is when it's good to take pictures because I can get a clear shot of Joe and the horses in a line. She's trying everything possible to get all kinds of different angles. And then she jumps off the horse and runs ahead of us or sometimes lags behind and then has to run to catch up. She's getting a total workout. I'm Peter Gwynn, editor at large at National Geographic, and you're listening to Overheard a show where we eavesdrop on the wild conversations we have here at Nat Geo and follow them to the edges of our big, weird, beautiful world. This week, we're joining a National Geographic photographer on assignment in the deep wilderness. So how did Katie Orlinski, a born and bred New Yorker, end up as a hardcore backcountry photographer? More after this. Check, check, check. One, two, three. We've been in the Gila for nine days, so we're almost at the end of our trip. It's dark. Katie and I are in a stand of ponderosas. The horses have grazed and are tied up for the night. 
It's a little overcast, and there's a huge moon that casts deep shadows around the trees. Katie is hoping to capture elk watering at a little pond nearby at dawn. But now it's freezing. The forecast calls for snow. So we're bundled up in our down jackets and huddled around the campfire. All right. So we've been doing these in the studio, but this is our first in the field. This is the, the, the campfire tapes. You're the inaugural. I'm honored. Yeah. Well, yeah. I was kind of thinking, though, in terms of, as a photographer, trying to take pictures while sitting on the back of a horse probably isn't the best <laughs> or easiest thing. It is I'm, not. I'm I mean, guessing, after watching yeah. you for nine days. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's not. I mean, it's interesting because on the one hand, you have, um, you know, you've got all your gear, and I've been on trips where you know, like 10 day, 12 day, 20 day trips where you're backpacking and you're carrying all your stuff. It's also incredibly difficult uh, to be photographing when you've got 60 pounds on your back. So it's very hard on a horse in some respects, um, especially just because you can't stop and sort of yeah. run ahead and you can't really control where, where you are. You kind of have to be quick. Yeah. So. Well, okay. So you mentioned these other trips and that's kind of where I first heard about you. The legend of Katie Orlinsky. <laughs> This crazy woman out in the wild crazy of Alaska. Woman out in the- <laughs> I mean, seriously, that's the, like, yeah. the first story. I mean, actually, it was a story. We were talking about this earlier that we did a story about the... Um, the Yukon Quest. The Yukon yeah. Quest dog race. Yeah. And you were the photographer. And I had not even heard of this. Tell me about Alaska. So how did you end up in Alaska? And- sure. In 2014, I had this random assignment from a magazine. The last story I had done for them had been a story about Ciudad Juarez. And then they gave me this assignment to go to the Yukon of Canada to photograph a thousand mile dog sled race. But when it's Ciudad Juarez, in my limited understanding of geography, is warm. Yes. (laughs) In Alaska, dog races happen in the bitter cold. Oh yeah, I had never been anywhere so cold. Mm -hmm. Now uh, I'm like winter clothes expert, but back then I had no idea. But I knew I got cold, so I was like, you know, I had, like, everybody's borrowed ski clothes and this giant parka. Yeah. And still, it was, you know, it wasn't enough. Okay, so what's the Yukon Quest? I mean, people, I think, have heard of the Iditarod. Yeah. You know, and I, I have a general idea of that, but Yukon Quest is different. It's different. I mean, and it's similar to the Iditarod. It's another 1,000-mile sled dog race, but this one um, follows this old gold rush trail. So, um, you like just the, said that, like... Oh, it's another thousand mile dog race. Like, <laughs> um, but, yeah, but yeah, no. So, it's like it's a 10K. But it's in February. So that means it's dark most of the day wow. and it's freezing cold. Yeah. But yeah, so they're really, really tough people. Um, and they have this incredible bond with their dogs. The whole thing was just like, I, was, I had no idea. I didn't even know what the Iditarod was when I got the assignment. So I was just like, what is this world? I thought it was so incredible. And so the place was beautiful. The sport was beautiful. It was the first sport I ever cared about. Like, oh, I mean, I like the Knicks. But other than that, you know, it's, it's not fun to be a Knicks fan. I went back that summer and continued photographing it, and it sort of was like this entree to the Arctic for me, but also to starting to cover the environment and climate change. Because while you're on these races, part of it is that it makes them really dangerous now because rivers will melt that are supposed to be frozen. And then on that race, we were supposed to drive across this ice road, and then we like get halfway across. Like this isn't a road anymore, you know. We and we could have fallen through. Wow. So there's just even in the context of this one thousand mile race you'll see so many instances of of climate change firsthand and I had never seen that before yeah. you know doing most of my work in this in kind of like the southern part of the world and right. growing up in New York City so that was really powerful um, and just made me more interested in learning more about those stories so how do you even photograph this I mean you said it's dark most of the time yeah, it's 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 hard. It's a challenge, but it's also um, when there is light, the light's spectacular. So that's something that's you yeah. know anybody that lives up north and works up north knows is just like you really uh, cherish those moments of sunlight because it's so special. Mm-hmm. You're so you know you're so high up that it just sort of it's like the golden hour all day long yeah. when it, when it is light out there. And then it's just you know it's fun. It was such an adventure to try to get to the right spot find a bridge to stand on to get the right perspective, finagle somebody to fly you in their plane somewhere or to take mm-hmm. you on their snow snow machine. So, And at that point, it wasn't 
dangerous in the same way that sort of, you know, covering the kind of stories that I had been doing before was, you know, it gave you a bit of a rush, but I wasn't, um, you weren't really dealing with sort of like this life or death situations. And so it was a bit of a break, to be honest, from Mm -hmm. covering a lot heavier stories. Right. And, um, and it was really refreshing. Like emotionally, I guess. Yeah. And, you know, if you're asking somebody for a favor, you're not putting them in harm's way. Like uh, the story I'd done right before that was was another story in Juarez, and it was about the people that worked for El Diario. And I mean, so many so this people. This is a newspaper, right? It's a newspaper, yeah. you know, and they're, you know, and it was called like the the bravest journalists or something. So um, this is Juarez, Mexico. Juarez, Mexico, and I'm just, you know, and I'm working with these journalists who've who've lost so many colleagues, and we're kind of, you know, chasing crime scenes, and it's um. It's it's a lot. It's a lot to take in, and I think it's they're really really important stories. But I think I, I hadn't really had anything. I hadn't been photographing anything that was a bit lighter yeah. up until that point. So when I got out to the Yukon, it was just like I just felt like exactly what I needed. Well, I think that's kind of a good place to say. Well, how did you get into photography originally? Because I never really thought I'd become a photographer, and um, I didn't study it. I studied. Uh, Latin American studies and political science in college. And so I was mostly self-taught. And then I moved to Mexico and worked at a nonprofit organization. And then um, and then I got a job at the local newspaper there, um, which was El Noticias de Oaxaca. And um, I think I made like $100 a month or something. But I could, but it worked because I was, you know, I was young and that was all I needed to yes, live out there. Right. And and I guess I I didn't really think I'd become a professional photographer. I thought I'd end up like going to grad school and like working at the UN. But I was really interested in politics and what was going on in the world. And I was an activist and I would take pictures at protests. And I just realized I wasn't, I wasn't very good at the organizing part. But I really liked taking the pictures and I felt sort of like, you know, I can choose stories and be an activist in that way. Do you remember the first photograph you took where you were kind of like, wow, that's really cool I like that that really you're like I'm, I'm, maybe I maybe I, maybe can, do I can do this yeah. I, well yeah so I was in Oaxaca um, and then a conflict there broke out in 2006 there was this big uh, so this is Mexico you know, this right? is in Mexico yeah. I still didn't think I'd really I still didn't think I was any good yeah. Um, but yeah this big conflict broke out and and um, all of a sudden you know international news media was there all the best photographers in Mexico were there and I was taking pictures for the local paper um, and it was It was a big deal. Um, There were street fights and there were kind of fires. And then um, the protesters took over the city. They essentially kind of kicked the governor out for a while. So there was this standoff there for six months. It was a really kind of exciting moment to photograph. But I also could see what I wasn't doing, you know, because the next day I'd look at La Jornada, which is sort of like like the New York Times of Mexico. Um, And then there was even a New York Times correspondent there once. And I'd see what they were shooting and be like, oh, okay, like I'm not as good as them. Mm -hmm. Um, But I'm always in the same place as them. Like, I can always get myself to where the photo that needs to be taken gets taken, but I just didn't know, I didn't have the right equipment yet, Mm -hmm. you know, but I feel like that was a moment where I was like, I think I have a knack for this. Yeah. But do you remember the, like, the image that you got that was like, is there, is there sort of like a... Yeah, it's like this line of federal police and there's like this, and there's like, it's backlit and there's sort of like the sun is coming out over them. Um, Yeah. And I, and I knew it was a good photo. Yeah. I remember one time somebody... They were talking about a young person. Somebody asked, you know, are they any good? And they said, they're not good yet, but they know what good looks like. And I think that's kind of what you're describing is that, like, you get to the point where it's like you can spot what a good photograph is or a good, a well-written story. Yeah. And you're good enough to know that you're not good yet. Yeah. If you see a big story, if there's any a big story happening anywhere in the world, there was this t- period of time where I felt like I had to be there. Mm-hmm. And I'm grateful that there's people out there, you know, doing really great work covering those big news stories. But it did, it started to feel like, okay, you know, where, where am I needed? Or where yeah, can I bring right. something to the table? Um, but in the beginning, it was just like, I just wanted to be there. Well, I, I think that's what a lot of young journalists, like, there's a lot of romanticism, a lot of false romanticism, I think, that's attached to, you know, jumping in the middle of conflict and covering it. And, um, you know, but it's, you know, it is how we learn about these things. I mean, I think, you know, definitely most of the things that I've, you know, have happened in my career, the help that I've gotten has all come from other photographers. You know, mm-hmm. it's a really wonderful community. In those situations, you know, you really rely on local journalists. And I like, can't express enough how much 
respect um, and how brave all the journalists, the local journalists in Mexico are, and yeah. they're the ones that are getting killed. Right. Um, and, you know, anytime there's a foreign reporter, you know, they, they'll just take you in and right. they'll show you around and you get to leave. Yeah. And they have to stay. Right. Um, and I think, you know, that's the case all over the world. Right. Um, but right. it's definitely the local journalists who kind of, we rely on them so much. Right, right, right. So, I, you know, I get this question a lot, and I'm sure you do too, and I'm just, I'd love to hear how you answer it. Young people that say, hey, you know, how do I start? Yeah. You know, and I remember asking that question. Right. And now it's funny, like, uh, I don't know, like, what do you tell people? Well, well, first I'm just, you know, just, you got to be curious. And right. um, you can't be afraid to talk to people. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then you just have to go out and do it. So, you know, if, if you want to be a photographer, start taking pictures, you know, find, right. find the story that you think is interesting and meet the people and take the pictures. And right. even if they're not good, you know, you're going to, you're going to meet somebody and you're going to build a relationship with a person. And that ends up being the most important thing about this job right. is, is like the quote unquote subjects is the people you spend time with. And if you like that, then you know that this is the career for you and then you can learn how to be a better photographer that can come later but you know if you're that curious about people and you think that telling stories is important then you should just go do it okay so tomorrow what's your strategy for getting <laughs> it's our 10, la- my it's 10, our, it's my 10 our, miles on the horse <laughs> <laughs> it's our last day we have to go 10 miles to get back to civilization and uh or out of the wilderness i guess is the right so what's your, do you, do you have a game plan? Well, for, after this. Well, what's the picture you want? You desperate, if you get oh. one more picture on this trip, Katie, what, what's the picture? What's the picture? Oh, a, there's a few. <laughs> a bear eating a elk. Apart from, <laughs> apart from wildlife, which, um, it would be nice to see some animals, um, but. Come on, we saw a tassel or squirrel today. We did, we did, we saw, we saw. You got a picture of it. <laughs> it's like a combination bunny rabbit squirrel. We saw it. <laughs> Totally, they really exist. It was saw. way up high in a tree. It's, um, I'm sure. I'm the bunny sure, rabbit yeah. squirrel. That's a perfect description. If I can make a picture that has something special to it that makes you kind of look deeper and, and think harder, yeah. um, you know, that's all I want to do. More after this. People think being a National Geographic photographer is all exotic travel and gilded sunsets. But what people don't see is the times when it all goes wrong. Katie took incredible photos on her trip, but she also did it with a broken camera. Katie, I'm recording. (laughs) Yeah, what's going on here? Well, um, we've had a series of disasters, one of which is my main camera broke before we even left. (laughs) <laughs> it fell off the horse and broke. And um, my main lens is kind of mostly broken. Um, and then um, I lent uh, uh, Brian, <laughs> then I lent you my tripod and it was returned to me. And, and then somehow over the course of the day, the crucial piece of the tripod went missing. I, I take credit for breaking the tripod. I'm sorry. Uh, you know, I'm doing I'm doing my best. Well, it's a beautiful sunset anyway. <laughs> but okay, so but we're in this amazing, beautiful place, looking at this pink and blue uh, overlook, and it's gorgeous. And I'm cursing at my camera, <laughs> so I'm really enjoying the moment, really, really staying present. So, so you're <laughs> photographing the sunset with a broken lens. <laughs> a broken lens and a broken body. On a broken tripod. On a broken tripod. <laughs> <laughs> well, and now everyone knows. <laughs> but hey, look at that beautiful picture I just took. A few of the pictures that Katie took during this trip can be seen on the National Geographic website and at Nat Geo on Instagram. It's a sneak peek of an upcoming magazine story and podcast episode about what we were doing in the wilderness in the first place. But in the meantime, if you're interested in seeing some of Katie's other photographs, we've included a few links in our show notes to some of her previous stories. In her work on the Yukon Quest dog sled race, you can see what it looks like to cross a thousand miles of Alaska on dog power. On Katie's personal website, you can see more images, 
including from her time in Juarez. And magazine subscribers can see Katie's photos in our recent story about thawing permafrost. Sometimes that thaw creates pockets of methane under frozen lakes that scientists test by setting on fire. Yeah, it makes a totally crazy picture. That's all in the show notes, right there in your podcast app. Overheard at National Geographic is produced by Brian Gutierrez, Jacob Pinter, Laura Sim, Carla Wills, and Alana Strauss. Our senior editor is Eli Chen. Our executive producer of audio is Devar Ardalan. Our fact checkers are Michelle Harris, Robin Palmer, and Julie Beer. Our copy editor is Amy Kolzak. Hans Dale Sue sound designed this episode and composed our theme music. This podcast is a production of National Geographic Partners. Whitney Johnson is the director of visuals and immersive experiences. Susan Goldberg is National Geographic's editorial director. And I'm your host, Peter Gwynn. Thanks for listening and see y'all next time.